Hi everyone, today we are going to discuss the impact of alcohol on your brain. Specifically, we will discuss the impact of alcohol on your brain's physiology and how it changes your cognitive functioning. So as you might have probably guessed already, alcohol has a substantial impact on all the different parts of your brain as well as every other organ system in your body. But for the purposes of just this introductory video, we will just focus on the hippocampus, the dopaminergic pathways, the HPA axis, as well as the cerebral cortex. So now you might be wondering, well, how does alcohol interact with my brain or neurons in the first place? And that is like a really, really good question. And you're going to get to that right now. Basically, alcohol or like ethanol molecules are very small, even though they are polar, they are allowed to pass through the brain barrier, blood brain barrier. And after getting to the neurons in your brain, they bind allosterically to GABA A receptors, which and they cause the receptor to have a higher affinity for its ligand GABA A. And basically, GABA A acts as like the chief or like the main inhibitory neurotransmitter in the central nervous system. It works by hyperpolarizing the neuron or basically making the charges inside the neuron more negative compared to the outside. And it does this by allowing negatively charged ions such as bicarbonate and chloride ions to pass to diffuse inside the cell and so it acts basically like a channel for these negatively charged ions and essentially what it does is it makes the it diminishes the neurons ability to fire action potentials which in essence you could say that it alcohol depresses the nervous system and makes it higher harder for the brain to launch new action potentials. So now that we have an understanding of how alcohol or ethanol actually impacts the brain, we can go into more detail about the physiological consequences of drinking alcohol. So first, let's talk about alcohol and its impact on memory formation. Have you ever went out with your buddies and drank a little bit too much and the next day you woke up hungover and you could not even remember like a single detail from last night? Well, as you might have guessed, alcohol is directly interfering with your ability to store or even form memories in the first place. In order to understand this phen phenomenon better, we have to understand the theories of memory formation and how memories are actually stored. So basically there are two main theories. The first one is called the standard theory of memory formation and it makes no distinction between semantic memories. For example, semantic memories are memories that rely on basic facts, for example, pure memorization or raw, raw data. For example, if someone asks you, hey, when did you graduate from college? And you respond, 1998. That's a type of semantic memory because it doesn't require a lot of detail or emotion. It's just a basic fact. But the other type of memory is episodic memory. And episodic memory is more emotionally salient and requires greater detail. For example, if someone asks you what happened during your 18th birthday party, you have to actually recall, go back and recall like, oh, I was at the birthday party, this happened. It's basically more detailed and most of the times associated with more memories than just like a fact. For example, just to give another example, a semantic memory is, for example, oh, what is the capital city of France? And it's just a fact, Paris. It doesn't require a lot of emotions on your part. And as I mentioned earlier, 
the standard memory, a standard theory of memory formation doesn't make a difference or a distinction between these types of memory storage. It basically says that both of these memory types get stored in the hippocampus tissue first. And as time goes by, the hippocampus become the, the memories get transferred to the cerebral cortex or other regions of the brain and the hippocampus role in memory recall and storage diminishes over time. So as time goes by, hippocampus is no longer necessary. In contrast, the multiple trace theory makes a distinction between these, between semantic memory formation and episodic memory formation. And it basically says that it basically says that semantic memories are first stored in the hippocampus and they gradually get transferred to the cerebral cortex, which is the same as the standard model. But in the cases of episodic memory, the multiple trace theory says that the hippocampus, the memories from hippocampus get transferred to other parts of the brain. But the key distinction is that the memories stay in the hippocampal tissue also, and the, the connections between the cerebral cortex and hippocampus doesn't diminish over time. So you need the hippocampus whenever you're recalling episodic memories. So this diagram summarizes the multiple trace theory when you're not drunk or you haven't consumed any alcohol. As you can see, in the semantic memory, the hippocampus role diminishes over as time goes on, but in the episodic memory, the hippocampus still plays a role even after a lot of time has passed. But if you contrast this diagram to when you have consumed alcohol, you can see a stark difference. The ethanol, as you mentioned, makes the neurons not be able to fire as, qu as quickly or so they cannot form as many connections with other neurons. And these connections get inhibited because they are not even formed in the first place because the neuron is hyperpolarized because of the alcohol in your body. And if you see in both types of memory, both semantic and episodic memory, the ethanol is inhibiting the connections. So your brain can't form or like store memories. And that's one of the main reasons why you can't remember the night, what you did the night before, because the memory wasn't even formed or even stored in the first place. Another important thing to note is that alcohol decreases plasticity and basically what happens in your brain is long-term potentiation in, or LTP is really important for learning and the formation of memories and if you don't know what LTP is it's basically when two neurons communicate together often and regularly and the synaptic strength is increased. And this is highly associated with memory formation and also, as I mentioned, learning. And what happens is alcohol prevents LTP formation as the formation of LTP is taught to require NMDAR receptors and alcohol blocks these channels which basically decrease the formation of LTP at the synapse. And this is also probably another explanation for why memories aren't formed or like stored in the brain after you, you consume alcohol. It also partly explains why if you're, for example, trying to study or like learn a new instrument or learn something in general, you're going to have a lot of difficulty learning it compared to when you're not drunk because long-term potentiation is decreased when you consume alcohol so you're not forming LTPs. So now that we have already talked about alcohol's impact on memory formation and storage we can move on and talk about alcohol impact on the dopamine pathways in your brain. As you may have already known 
Dopamine is generally viewed as the happy neurotransmitter because not only is it involved in movement, but it's also heavily involved with the reward and pleasure systems in your brain. The dopamine pathways have long been implicated in different forms of addiction, for example, gambling addiction and dependence to different substances such as alcohol and just in general riskier behavior. So in essence, what happens is that there are the special neurons in your brain or different, that form different pathways in the different regions of your brain and they have stored dopamine in vesicles and when something like a ligand stimulates their receptors, they release these dopamines all over the brain. And there are multiple different pathways, but the two most important ones that have been implicated with alcohol are the mesocortical pathway and the other one is the nigrostriatal pathway. And basically what happens is ethanol molecules stimulate the ventral segmental area in the brain as well as the substantia nigra which causes the neurons to release the dopamine to other regions in the brain and as you might have already like maybe you have already wondered why do some people for example can drink a lot and really often but not get addicted to alcohol and have a dependency but other people maybe they drink once a week and they still get addicted and they can't quit drinking. And the reason for that is alcohol is both, alcohol dependency is both affected by the environment and the genetic factors. For example, a study, for example, showed that different recept do dopamine receptors for that ethanol binds to if, for example, one allele time has a higher affinity for ethanol molecules, that individual might be more of a risk of having alcohol dependency. But in contrast, if an individual has the allele for ethanol, or that is like the allele for the dopamine receptor, then they and by, doesn't bind alcohol as tightly as the other individual, then this individual might not get addicted to alcohol as easily. Another thing to mention is that recently scientists have discovered that as a person drinks more alcohol, the genes that are involved in dopamine, dopamine pathways become increasingly tied to regulated. So what I mean by this is for example like when you drink there are like certain transcription factors and proteins that are involved in uh, your brain actually seeking rewards and getting rewarded in the dopamine pathways and these are heavily like get tightly regulated for example maybe the histones become more com condensed and form hydrochromatin in those regions or maybe they get modifications such as methylation deacetylation which would decrease or inhibit the formation or like the transcription of the happy genes so as you drink more and more actually what happens is you don't get the same amount of pleasure because what is happening in your brain is your brain is more tightly regulating those happy proteins and neurotransmitters from forming so in order to get the same effect you actually need to drink more and more and more and it's unfortunately like a positive loop because the more you drink, the more tightly the pathways of transcription machinery and protein synthesis form become. So in the end, you have to drink, drink, drink. And as you drink, drink more, it becomes more and more tightly regulated. So you even have to drink, drink more to get the same happiness or the same reward. So that's why you see, for example, alcoholics binge drinking compared to other people and they are consuming a lot of like alcoholic drinks and stuff it this is because they simply are not getting the same reward or the same pleasure as the other person who is not drinking as often because 
the person that doesn't drink as often, the dopamine pathways function regularly and they are not as tightly regulated. But the alcoholic person's brain unfortunately needs a lot of alcohol to get like stimulated. So that's part of the reason why, for example, you see people binge drinking. It's because the alcohol is not having the same impact as them as before. So now we can talk about alcohol's impact on the HPA axis. But if, before we understand how alcohol affects the axis, it's important to understand how the HPA axis works in the first place. So the HPA axis is mainly responsible for stress regulation and the release of cortisol into the body. So it starts with the hypothalamus, which is located in the brain getting stimulated, which causes the hypothalamus to release the corticotropin releasing hormone, also known as CRH. The CRH travels to the anterior pituitary and causes the anterior pituitary to release pump C peptides, for example, pump C A, pump C B, and the pump C peptides get cleaved to form ACTH, which is then released and it gets down to the kidneys and travels to the adrenal gland and causes the cells in the adrenal cortex to release the stress hormone cortisol. So there are two main methods that alcohol acts through to disrupt the HPA axis and causes dysfunction in the body's response to a stress. The first method are basically they involve epigenetic modification, for example, histone acetylation, and also, for example, like the condensation of heterochromatin to euchromatin. And also the other method, the second method is actually the disruption of negative feedback loop. If you remember, there is a negative feedback loop. For example, as the cortisol level goes up, it starts to inhibit the cycle and actually prevents more cortisol from getting transcribed or getting released. Alcohol basically interferes with the negative feedback loop and both of these factors cause causes the body to generate more pump C A peptides, more pump C B peptides and obviously as you learn those gets those ones get played to ACTH but they also lead to an increase in the corticotropin releasing hormone. And all of these act to increase the stress levels of the individuals and more cortisol getting formed. And obviously, as you know, there is a lot of like side effects to higher cortisol levels and it just makes you more anxious and there is also a lot of health problems and as I'm sure you're already aware of. And another interesting thing is that alcohol actually, as you can see, increases your stress levels, not decreases them. Some people, for example, they have a stressful day and they think like if they drink alcohol, it actually decreases their stress levels. But the opposite is actually true. Alcohol actually increases your how anxious you are and how stressed out you are, but you may not notice it until the next day because the dopamine is rewarding your brain and causing you to drink more. But as you can see, like the, the surprising thing is, for example, since alcohol increases your stress levels and cortisol levels, it causes you to drink more and more. For example, if you had like a stressful day, then you might try to drink alcohol but it's actually increasing your stress levels. And that's another reason why people get addicted to alcohol because it's not actually helping your stress levels, it's increasing them. So you get addicted more easily. Thank you for watching.